The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar presented by Global Edge. The discussion topic for today is Accounts Payable Recovery Audit. Our learning objectives will focus on common misconceptions around recovery audits, why they exist, and the truth behind the misconceptions. We will provide you with recovery examples and offer recommendations on best practices. The speakers will also provide insight on audit details from both the client and provider perspective. At the end of the discussion, we will have time to answer questions. Before we begin, I'd like to mention a couple of items. Today's presentation is based on the experience and knowledge of the presenters, and your organization may experience more or less complicated situations. However, the material is designed for all industries and company sizes. We also encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation using the box on the menu panel, which should be located to the right of your screen. At this time, I would like to welcome and introduce today's speakers, Eric Henneke, who is the Senior Manager of Supply Risk Management, Finance, Audit and Controls at Mayo Clinic. Eric has worked in Mayo Supply Chain Management for nearly six years with a focus on supplier risk management, audit and controls, and financial planning analysis. Lisa Ledoux is the Director of Risk Management at Global Edge. Lisa brings years of experience in fraud investigation and has received numerous awards for fraud investigating. Both Lisa and Eric are certified fraud examiners. Thank you, Lisa and Eric, for joining us today. Lisa will begin the presentation with a brief overview of Mayo Clinic. Thank you, Emily. Mayo Clinic is world-class in providing health care to their patients, but they're also leaders in business strategy. What you might not know is Mayo Clinic has been recognized for their supply chain success. Together with Eric, we will begin our discussion with a few misconceptions some have about accounts payable recovery auditing. Not all audit firms are the same or use the same technology, nor do they have the same expertise. When auditing behind another firm, we still find money. Just last year, we conducted an audit for a smaller organization, which had an audit the year before. When we came in, we found $380,000 in recoveries as a secondary audit. Your first audit may have only reached the low-hanging fruit. It is the subsequent audit that will validate the depth of the first audit and the results of the changes you may have implemented due to what was found in that audit. This is why we've learned from our clients that they use us year after year and even incorporate our auditors into the continuous monitoring. Eric, at Mayo Clinic, you have an in-house audit team, but you also have a full-time Global Edge auditor on site. Would you talk about why Mayo Clinic uses both internal and external auditing teams? You bet, Lisa. So several years ago, we started working with Global Edge in audit recovery efforts. And what we discovered was that, to your point earlier, we, we had some low-hanging fruit that we actually felt we could handle in-house within our own staffing. But in addition to that, that low-hanging fruit you described, there was a secondary level of recovery opportunity that we were missing out on. And so in concert and in partnership with Global Edge, we do some auditing ourselves and some auditing we leave to the Global Edge on-site person who's, who's with us full time. And we found that, uh, to, or to, again to your point, that you know most times when audit firms come in, they initially kind of make that, that low-hanging fruit pass and do leave some of that you know, more difficult recovery, but, but sometimes often um, it's very lucrative recovery dollars on the table, if you will. And so, you know, we believe strongly in a, sec a primary and a secondary audit uh, just to make sure that we've recovered everything that's possible. And so some of those recoveries, while you may have a smaller audit the first year, um, the second year could be completely different. And have you seen that year after year as you've audited? Yeah, absolutely. You know, typically if you, um, we'll talk about this a little later, but if you're putting the right controls in place, those dollars will come down. 
but it's interesting that new things tend to surface over time. And as what well, we've learned that as Global Edge has learned our business better, they've been able to find some of those new opportunities that we didn't know were out there. Okay. Let's take a look at a recovery example that requires looking beyond the low-hanging fruit. So our sales tax auditors question the tax laws and work with states to clarify tax rulings that benefit our clients. After working with the state of Florida, one of our auditors obtained binding rulings on behalf of our client to clarify some of the gray areas. The end result was the collection of over $25 million net after the full sales and tax audit con was conducted by the state. Um, it's this type of example where it's not just low-hanging fruit, it's understanding the nuances of the industry you're, you're looking at, but also the state regulations. And Eric, sometimes the people that are making the payments, um, like your AP staff, they may or may not know the tax laws. And, and how does that affect what the auditor is doing versus what's being paid? Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, I, I don't think it's probably unique in our organization, but the people that, that make payments aren't tax experts. You know, they're not experts in, in a lot of things that, a lot of, a lot of the legal terminology that is really required to understand um, when, you know, when we should be paying something versus when we shouldn't. And so your point is well taken. You know, AP experts are experts on AP, not on tax. And it's really important, I think, to have somebody who has at least, uh, at least a, a minimal knowledge of those types of laws and regulations that can come in on your behalf and, and just do a, a second look, you know, do a, a, a pass to see whether or not you're, you're making those payments appropriately. Okay. And not all accounts payable departments have the time or resources to do this in-house or take a task like this and look at um, the different nuances relating to tax in the industry. Um, and they don't have the resources, and so it's important to have that outside set of eyes come in. And it may be a small little issue that you start to identify that then escalates into a very large dollar amount for the recovery. And, and so it's those large dollar value. It may be small or it may be large, but by looking at the entire picture, you can start to see what your exposure is. And our experience has shown that minimal errors can add up. And there's always isolated instances of human error. And it's important in a recovery audit to keep in mind, we're not trying to catch somebody doing something wrong. What we're trying to do is identify money that can come back to the bottom line. And if there is a process or a system error where there's a gap in the procedures, to tighten that gap or to give best practices to prevent those overpayments in the future. And then, Eric, how many times do you see a small error that ends up being very, very large to the organization? Yeah, I'd say that's pretty frequent. You know, a lot of people have a misconception that when an auditor comes in, you know, that they're that they're going to find that half million dollar one time recovery, and that's actually not how it generally works. A lot of times, it's those smaller, few hundred dollars, few thousand dollar type of recoveries that are discovered. But what oftentimes happens, and I've seen this many times, is um, you know that thousand dollar recovery rolled back over the last three years turns into a pretty big deal. And when you're as complex as we are, as, as I'm sure many organizations are on this call, you know, you think about all the various divisions and all the various areas and all, all of, you know, all the contracts that we're talking about, all the vendors we're talking about, um, those, those small little things, you know, tend to add up quite quickly when you start to extrapolate it across kind of a larger vendor population and spend population. So, you know, it's it's actually rare that I see, at least at least from my seat, that we find those really big, you know, one time big hit types of recoveries. But a lot of times, when you really peel back the onion, that's where you start to find the big dollars. Okay, and as I mentioned, we're not we're we're not looking at the individuals that are part of the payables process for them to do something wrong, and having that outside audit firm come in can identify where things could be changed to prevent those overpayments. And Eric, how does it help to have an outside auditor when you're communicating the message back to your AP team 
to say, hey, money was found. This is where it was found. This is how it happened. How does it help? And, and what is the interaction there between the auditor and your AP team? Yeah, that's a, a good question. And you know, you actually alluded to this a little bit earlier, and, and I'll comment on it now. One of the one of the hurdles that you have to get past when um, when doing this kind of recovery is, you know, the fact that you're pointing out something that somebody's doing wrong, and that's that's something that that you have to really work with your staff to be sure that that, that it's clear to them that's not the point. Um, and so it's helpful, I think, to have somebody as an intermediary between, you know, a global edge type of auditor and ultimately the person who is, I'll say responsible, but I'll put that in quotes. Uh, because what, what, what we've been able to do is to bridge that gap nicely so that you know, nobody feels like they're being picked on, but yet we have a chance to really step back and look at a process that we've identified now that has a gap, a control gap somewhere, and you know, have a conversation about um, how we fix that control gap so that it doesn't happen again. So it actually works out pretty nicely, and um, and and, so and it works well. In our, I'm sorry, Lisa. It works well in our industry as well, um, and in our group as well, to um, bridge that gap between ourselves and the auditors. Okay. And so let's take a look at a recovery example that shows how common billing issue can mean thousands of dollars for a client. When looking at a duplicate payment, some will skim over, for instance, utility bills because most utility bills will reconcile on the next billing cycle. Utility bill auditing can be very specialized. We have found that a utility company was billing at $25,000 every month as an estimated billing for a new service account at a construction site. What we discovered was that the utilities had never been turned on. This resulted in a pretty large recovery for our client. And it's important to understand that there's differences in the types of recoveries and having an expertise in the industry you're looking at, and as we mentioned earlier, the different tax laws as they pertain to each state. And so oversight can still happen even when you have strong controls in place. And, and so you want to understand where you have that gap and have that outside eyes look in and identify where your organization might be losing money. The next is we'd like to look at the common belief we often hear that um, time and resources can be limited for new projects. Many believe that they, don't have, that they need to have a budget for an AP audit. So they don't make it a priority and they don't really understand you know, how important the recovery is, but they put it out and keep saying, well, we'll do it next quarter, we'll do it next quarter, because we don't have a budget for this particular project. Eric, do you have a line item in your budget for AP recovery auditing? You know, it's funny, Lisa, I always, I always kind of chuckle when I hear this question. And the reason is, um, no, we don't. To answer your question, we, we don't have a line item budget in, or a line item expense in our budget. And the reason is really pretty simple, and I think a lot of people kind of miss this point. And that is, uh, this shouldn't really ever be an expense to your organization. It really should only be you know, a revenue or an incoming cash flow to your business. Um, what I, I think the, the thing that's often forgotten about a contingency-based type of audit is that um, you only pay if something is found. And so what we end up having to budget for on our side, if anything, is the anticipated dollars coming back into the organization or revenues coming back into the organization, however you might look at it. So we don't, we don't do any, really any budgeting as it relates to audit recovery. You know, there's one thing I'll say also about kind of the resource, uh, the resource issue, because I think there's a, there's a misperception, and maybe it's it's fair because other auditors don't do this as well. But in terms of resources, we've really found that it doesn't require hardly anybody to participate outside of the of the Global Edge auditors um, after the initial IT information is provided. Uh, excuse me, the IT data is provided by usually an IT resource, and it's rare that um, we really have to pull in anybody else um, except for uh, maybe a weekly recap of kind of where we're sitting and some of the things that are happening. But for the most part, we, we forget 
global edge is there, and in some cases they're actually not. They're off-site kind of doing their thing. And we really, uh, you know, have very, very little resource pull that uh, we experience. And so it's mostly just the communication and keeping you as the client up to date as to what's going on with the audit. Yeah, absolutely. And that's very helpful to us. Um, you know, we have a weekly, usually a weekly, maybe every couple week meeting with the auditors. And, and they're the ones really with boots on the ground. They know what's going on. They, they have uh, some, some things for us if we choose to follow up on, you know, in terms of a control. Uh, you know, if there's anything with controls that we want to look at. But really, uh, that, that, that meeting, that recap with them is more for uh, just for us to be advised of what's going on, what kind of recovery opportunities we're looking at, and that, that's really about it. Okay. And the next common misconception, a lot of people when they think of recovery auditing are thinking of duplicate payments. But there's a lot more to recovery auditing than just duplicate payments or straight accounts payable. It involves contracts and pricing, and it's important to involve the entire organization, as, as you mentioned, Eric, the IT department, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, too. But uh, if you have a different team that's handling your contracts and purchasing, understanding um, that there is an audit that's going to happen and letting them be aware um, that the audit team is going to be looking for recoveries that might cross over into their um, realm or sphere of control it helps to mitigate those tense feelings. Um, and so, Eric, the, the next example is a scenario that Mayo Clinic, being a hospital, may have experience with. And would you like to share your experience with this type of recovery involving contracting and pricing in the operating room? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, I think that, you know, when we, when we talk about contract pricing, this is an area that I don't consider low-hanging fruit, but certainly a, a, a large, ripe area for opportunity just by virtue of the volume of spend. And um, so we, you know, we chose to kind of take this path of exploring our contract spend, oh, I don't know, three, four years ago now. Um, and what we found in this one particular case, and we found variations of this, you know, also kind of throughout time, is... Um, what had happened was with, I kind of mentioned before, with the complexity of our business, and I don't think our business is that much different than most. Um, you think about all of the locations, all of the different items, you know, all of the different scenarios that items are used. And in this case, what happened was we have, you know, we certain, we certain items that we buy on contract and other items that, you know, perhaps we have a lower volume of use for and we do have off contract. And what happened was some of the items that we were buying that should have been on contract, we were being charged for um, based on a completely different type of product number for a non-contracted item. So more or less we're paying list price for it. And this is, kind of goes back to my point earlier of, you know, when you roll things back over time, you know, some of the, the scale and the volume of dollars that you can see as an opportunity for recovery uh, and so, you know, this, again, was a good kind of case study for us to say, take a step back and say, how did this happen? What, what could we have done or what should we do in the future to, keep, you know, prevent this from happening again? And it really was a, a pretty nice opportunity for us to recover some dollars that we had overpaid. And Eric, you mentioned the time and, and how far it goes back, especially with contract compliance auditing. The recovery audit typically is going to look backwards on 36 months worth of data, but your actual recovery may extend beyond that 36 months in this, you know, in a contracting case where it may be from the inception of the contract, the pricing never got entered into the ERP system and you've been paying a higher rate. There's different times where this, this amount is going to extend further than 36 months. And then also having that experienced audit staff that understands the state nuances, you have statute of limitations. And while Mayo Clinic might be in Minnesota, um, the vendor may be in a different state or the product, something may be happening in a different state that has a different statute of limitations. And understanding um, where recoveries can happen and how far back they can go is important and it also helps with those vendor relationships. We often have people that will ask us, well, you know, why should the vendor pay it back? Why are they going to pay it back? Well, this isn't hard collections. This is a vendor you're most likely still currently working with. 
And when an, when an item is identified, they're going to work with you and realize that, yes, in fact, it should have been at a lower rate, and they're going to refund the money. And yeah, so you know, you, I'll just, can I just ahead. step in here for a second, Lisa? I, I, I want to you know, piggyback off that a little bit. It's, it's very, very useful in situations like this and with some of the earlier tax type of discussions to have somebody who really understands what the laws are and what the statute of limitations might be. Because one thing that, you know, that we've discovered through the process is that sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes if we ourselves as Mayo goes back to a vendor and asks for money, there's, you know, there's a lot of conversation around, to your point, statute of limitations and what's, what's in, what's out of bounds, et cetera. But when you really, you know, when you really understand what the rules are, um, and, and Global Edge does, it's nice that you can have a partner to say, no, wait a minute, vendor. That's actually not true, and you know we, we can go back five years or three years or however long we want to go back. So I, I did want to highlight. I think that's an excellent point of having somebody kind of in your corner, if you will, absolutely um, and can, can make a huge difference. Okay, and and many believe that they don't need an outside audit firm because they have very tight controls, and the the place that you are least expecting a recovery is usually where it's going to happen. And there's always risk. And you know, the one thing about fraud is that it's very hard to find fraud. It's much easier to prevent fraud on the upfront. And so unfortunately, it is feasible to have fraudulent activity within your organization. And when we talk about AP recovery auditing, there's always that component of the auditor is seeing things you may not see. While you're following a set procedure, the auditor is looking at it differently, and they might identify either a fraudulent activity internally or externally from a vendor. And an external audit provides a way for you to verify your controls and procedures that they're working the way you expect them to be. The risk of fraud is always present, and fraudsters are always finding new ways around those controls that you have in place. Your company works hard to minimize the risk, but we've learned that proactive testing of these controls and regular auditing can keep you ahead of the exposure. Eric, having outside eyes review your process, have, have they ever looked at something differently than you and your team and caused you to rethink your controls? Yeah, definitely. You know, uh, we're not always looking at things through the, the eyes necessarily of something being fraudulent, but one of the things that that happens in any business and in any, any industry is you have you have control creep that happens over time. You have people who um, leave a position, switch positions, you, you know, um, and do different things over the duration of time. And it's oftentimes not intentional, but sometimes the the the, the best laid controls that you have end up failing because of a multitude of reasons. And it's, I guess, comforting, you could say, to have, uh, to know that there's somebody sort of, it sort of has your back, if you will, um, in looking at your processes from an outside, you know, new set of eyes perspective and being able to, you know, point out things in a non, you know, non-defensive type of way that, that, that you can take and use and, and help to change your processes. So, I mean, we found it extremely valuable. Thank you, Eric. That's very insightful. We have covered some common misconceptions so far and revealed reasons why they exist. And we've given some examples of recovery auditing and how it happens. At this time, let's look at recovery auditing and what it should look like. You know, the path of the recovery. Recovery auditing can be done in-house and externally, but most don't have the resources to have an internal audit continuously auditing um, they don't have that option for the in-house. The outside audit firm is the best option for most companies, both financially and to account for the staffing issues. The steps to a recovery audit can be summarized into four main events. You have the planning section, the meeting or the audit kickoff, the actual audit, and finally the summary or after action review. We discover that many clients aren't sure what to expect from a recovery audit or have had a bad experience in the past. They may not have been the one to engage the audit firm, or they may have been present or just hired at the time the last audit happened. There are steps that we take to streamline the process. 
Most importantly is setting the expectation for everyone involved. I mentioned letting, you know, if it's an AP recovery audit, let your purchasing team and your procurement team know that it's going to happen, but also include your IT department up front. This prevents any delay from the start of the audit. The data sets that are coming from your IT department will need to be provided um, and they need to be clearly defined. The audit firm would give you a map of what's going to happen and what data we need. Um, and so that also should include the transfer mechanism with directions to the IT team. How is this data going to transfer to the audit company? In addition to the data, there's an important piece that sometimes gets missed. We ask your AP team for a few sample invoices, purchase orders, and returns because as we get the data, and it has um, tables and information, we want to make sure that what we're seeing in the data lines up to actually your invoices and POs. This also helps if there's no data dictionary available. You may have a homegrown system. Um, if you use miscellaneous fields for notes or to override some system controls, um, you should let your audit team know that so that they know outside of the data we've requested there's some additional fields and we would be looking at that. Anytime you modify the fields in your system or create workarounds, that's where there's a potential for errors. When you meet your audit team, you want to set and agree upon goals to understand what the timeline is, how long the audit's going to take. At the entrance conference, we would discuss the scope of your involvement. As Eric mentioned, you know, what can you expect from the time commitment? Your IT time up front, that is clearly going to be needed, but what is the time commitment during the audit? We would also schedule weekly meetings that work within your timetable. Maybe you know you have month end or something happening that while we have a meeting each week on one certain week, you don't want to have a meeting, and that should be clearly spelled out so that everybody understands what the expectation is. We'll review potential claims and the status of the active claims um, that are, we're about to present to your vendors. And this is a really important step that Global Edge that sees a lot of value and our clients appreciate, is before we approach a vendor, we talk with you about the relationship with that vendor before we reach out to the vendor to say, hey, there's a potential recovery. This update allows for you, the client, to confirm that the audit team is on target for the completion of the audit and making sure that the preset timeline is being followed. Lisa, can I jump in here with a couple of items? Sure. The, you know, the, the first thing I'll say, um, I did want to highlight a couple of things that you said. The, um, the, the statement that you made about the IT resources I think is really, really critical. You know, um, one of the few things that, that I think delays and, and potentially can derail a, a successful audit is not having the right data and not having the right people to the, to the table to provide the data for you. And so I'll, I would highlight just, you know, that point that it's very, very important to have your IT colleagues engaged uh, right off the bat. The other thing I wanted to highlight, and I think you did it really nicely um, and mentioned it, that I've always found, you know, you hear the horror stories about audit recovery firms and, you know, and, and they, they irritate your vendors and, they, you know, they're, they're, um, you know, they're really kind of nasty to the vendors and things. One thing that um, I, I've always really appreciated about the way that Global Edge goes about the process is that they're very respectful to any potential vendor issues, any, you know, potential roadblocks that they may meet in dealing with a vendor. And like you had said, and I think you said it really well, um, you know, if a client says, hey, look, this vendor is going to be out of bounds for whatever reason, or this is a vendor I would rather contact with a, with a, a potential claim and not have you do it. Um, we've always found Global Edge to be very respectful of that and willing, completely willing to, um, to, to you know, allow us to, you know, to, to mediate a situation or maybe in some cases not even pursue it just because it's not a vendor relationship we want to disrupt. Right, and the, the next example is, is about identifying the recovery and, you know, the weekly review provides time to talk about those relationships because as you mentioned, Eric, if you have a lawsuit pending with a vendor for $10,000, you don't want me reaching out to the vendor for a $250 duplicate payment. 
and understanding that vendor relationship. The example here is it, the vendor didn't do anything wrong. The vendor sent an invoice. And then on the delivery, there was a copy of that invoice. And so the bill got paid twice, just because there were two different bills. The vendor didn't do anything. The question is, OK, now the payment was made twice. We have to reach out to the vendor. And is it OK to reach out to this vendor to get that duplicate payment back? Or as you mentioned, Eric, maybe you'd rather reach out. For the most part, the recovery audit firm is the one that does all of the collections. But there is that isolated instance where you say, no, we can only get that product from one supplier in the United States. They're the only one. Let us handle it. Thank you for pointing out, you know, there's a duplicate. We've got that. But those vendor relationships are very important to Global Edge. Because when we audit for a company, we're working with the vendors. But on our next audit that we go on to, those same vendors may apply industry to industry. And, and so we talk to the same people month after month on recoveries that we're finding. And so those relationships are just as important to Global Edge. The vendor relationship to Global Edge is as it is to the client to vendor relationship. You know, and then we often ask, what happens if the vendor won't pay? What happens when the vendor says, nope, I don't agree with it? We would set up a call between the vendor and our client to discuss what was found and hear what the vendor's contentions are. If the issue can't be resolved, the file's handed back over to you as the client. There is no recovery because money wasn't recovered. And if the client decides to file a lawsuit, that's up to the client. You know, Global Edge, we would do the actions to find the recoveries and identify them. But if, if there's no recovery, we're going to hand it back over to you. Most audit firms do not pursue litigation in an AP recovery audit situation. The method of payment is something else I want to touch on. You know, once the recovery is identified and the vendor agrees to pay it back, how does the client get paid? You know, the first important thing to remember is the money is always going to come back to the client, not the recovery audit firm. The money isn't cycling through us. It's going to you as the client. You process the recovery. And at that point, you receive a contingency fee from the audit firm that says, OK, you've got your money back. Now we get the contingency fee on that. The method of payment is up to the client. It can Sometimes most clients will maybe say, I only want to check. I want to keep it very clean. If the vendor is overpaid, I want the vendor to cut me a check. Other clients are still willing to accept short pay or take product in exchange um, for the recovery findings. We'll perform all the recovery functions, including identifying the findings, documenting the findings, and then reaching out to the vendor. And that's a really important step, that the audit firm should be the one to do all of the activity reaching out to the vendor to get the money back. When we reach out to the vendor, we work with the vendor to identify how did the overpayment happen? How was the cash misapplied in their books? And then that information should be documented in the end of audit report. These recoveries are discussed during the weekly meetings, so there should be no surprises in that end of audit report. You should never be left with a stack of claims which you're expected to follow up on. The audit firm should take care of all of that. At the end of your audit, you should also expect to receive some comprehensive reports on all of the recoveries. The comprehensive reports, um, they should be in multiple formats. You should have a report that lets you know what happened in the audit and best practices so you know how to improve on it. But there's also some reports that the auditor is going to use that help them through the audit that in turn come back to you with your own data set, such as duplicate vendors, duplicate addresses, uh, PO utilization. So you have some reports there that can help you. These reports will be in a format that should be something that helps you when you have meetings with either a C-suite or a board of directors. And there's also another element to these reports. They should be shared across the company because your contracting or purchasing team, they would be using these reports maybe if they were going to renegotiate a contract with a vendor. These spend analytics reports on vendor-specific line items can help that contracting team negotiate with the vendor maybe a better rate. And then there's one more step to these reports, understanding that um, the reports can tell you about the vendor and where the money was found, but understanding why the vendor suppressed the credits or misapplied your payments, 
the vendor behavior patterns should be monitored because there may be more to it, and it could be just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, I would highlight, we, um, I would say, Lisa, yeah, also, uh, that these reports become especially useful, you know, when you do an audit over and over. You know, and it, they're, they're very useful the first time, of course. But, you know, when you can layer them for past audits and, you know, when you can find the same, you know, kind of vendors doing the same kind of things, and in some cases, you know, unfortunately, they're kind of pulling shenanigans on you, this reporting becomes very powerful in, to your point, you know, correcting the behavior, um, renegotiating terms, et cetera. So, so there's, there's certainly, you know, a lot of value to be found and derived from these types of reports. Mm -hmm. And then talking about where recovery, most recoveries are found, regardless of your industry. It's not always the vendor and their misapplied cash. The recovery and the, and the information that points to why it happened can be also on your own process. So we typically will see recoveries in duplicates and sales and use tax, contracts, product return is another large category. But your organization may have caused the recovery rather than the vendor. For example, if you have to make a 50% upfront payment, a lot of the ERP systems won't allow for you to make two payments on that same invoice number. So folks will put an A after the invoice number. And what happens then is when the full invoice comes in, somebody might not see that a payment was made because they've altered the number. And so then the full amount is paid when the product is received. So you paid the 50% upfront, and now you've paid the full amount. And so a recovery audit can identify those types of errors as well. And so it's examples like this that makes an AP recovery audit so important to have that second set of eyes, somebody looking at your process. Your organization followed the procedures that you had in place. You, your organization may have said it's OK to put an A or a B or a 1 or a 2 behind that invoice number. And the staff abided by the policies but because that person who paid it with the A wasn't there the day the invoice came in, the full amount was paid. And so even though your team is doing everything right, there still might be something that goes wrong. And so now let's touch a little bit on what are the areas of recovery. Not every organization is going to have recoveries in all of these areas. But understanding the areas that could have recoveries your organization may not have a lot of exposure for royalties or trade discounts, but being able to look at those and just make sure there's no recoveries in those areas, the years of experience have taught us to look in the least expecting places because money tends to hide there. It's important to conduct a thorough analysis of the common areas, but also look at those specific areas. Some, an example of some specific areas where our audit team has found recoveries is pricing and co-op advertising are specific to the retail industry. Sales and use tax reviews are specialized for maybe hospitals or construction. And this might be industry specific, so it might be missed during your self-audit because our experience, we know to include these areas for review. An example would be like a healthcare facility um, they have a stint on the shelf. The stint might be taxable. However, once it's used on a patient, your organization may qualify for a tax credit. The same idea applies to a, a construction company or an excavating company when a large excavating drill bit breaks off in the ground. That same item may now have a very different tax classification because it's unrecoverable. So there's some best practices with recovery auditing. And, and regular auditing and identifying your fraud, risk, waste, abuse, all of those areas are part of the recovery audit. But there's more to it, as I mentioned, the reporting and understanding the root cause of how did it happen and how do I prevent it in the future. And the nice thing about recovery auditing, obviously, is money comes back to your bottom line. Everybody likes to see the money come back. But with that money coming back, um, identifying the best practices and making sure that system changes are made. Um, we have clients that we give the end of audit reports and the best practice to, and they make a lot of change. And they see their recoveries from year after year reduce. We have others that have an audit every year. 
we give them the reports and they don't change anything and we still find the same money in the same places. And it's really about that holistic approach to understanding supply chain and, and moving forward with the advancements in technology. You know, one more example that we can give on recovery auditing is is warranties and understanding, you know, the, the contracts, it's not specific to, say, a hospital. It might be a large um, capital equipment purchase and you have a warranty on it. Many of the purchases for an organization might have a, a maintenance plan. And we found a vendor that was charging maintenance charges for items that were still under warranty. Um, the items were no longer in service. And they had overlapping service contracts. And, and we talked a little bit about the behavior of the vendor. And this example really t touches on that to identify behavior patterns. In a typical recovery audit in the past, you would have just gotten your money from the vendor and said, you know, you shouldn't have done that. But really looking forward now at why the vendor is doing that and looking at a holistic approach to recovery auditing and the entire supply chain, looking at this vendor and saying, why did they do that? Why are they duplicate billing or, or billing something that we still have under warranty? Why are we getting service fees? And it's this holistic vendor data management is where recovery auditing of the past has gone. Auditing in the past used to be a couple of people showed up at your site, you provided them with a conference room and a telephone, and out came the banker boxes and the rubber fingers. Advances in recovery auditing and technology and the way data um, is looked at has changed the supply chain approach to that holistic approach. Supply chain needs have led Global Edge to integrate services so that you can get a better picture of your vendors, not just recover the money, but get an image of your vendors and with whom you're transacting. Through the integration of services, you can manage your vendor master file, run daily sanction checks, authenticate and interact with your vendors through a web-based portal, and combine this information with your accounts payable data. The analytics from the AP Recovery Audit can paint a comprehensive picture of your entire P2P vendor interaction. Because really with recovery auditing, it's about finding the money and looking at what, how we lost the money. But then understanding who you're transacting with. Most organizations in the past have had to send this same set of data out, as you see in the steps, to six, seven different providers. And Eric, have you seen that in the past where you're using a lot of providers? Yeah, certainly. You know, in our case, um, and, and I really, really like this slide, Lisa. You know, in our case, we were using multiple vendors for kind of all these functions along the continuum. And I, I think your point is well taken that, you know, the I sort of chuckled hearing the, the bank boxes and rubber fingers. It's so true. That's, that is truly how you know, how recovery auditing used to work and function, and it's very, very different now. It's more data-driven, um, and it's more analytical, I would, I would say, than what it used to be, you know, more in, when it was more of a manual process. But I think this slide really does a good job of, of pulling everything together that should be included in at least a, a discussion topic related to a recovery audit, uh, because all these pieces ultimately fit together into a big puzzle. And to your point, um, you know, you, we now have the ability with the, the technologies that are out there to take a holistic look at our vendors and, and, and to your point, again, not having to do so via, you know, half dozen or, or more vendors. And so, um, you know, this, I, I think you, you, you hit it directly on the head in, in, in sort of indicating all the opportunity here um, across the entire, per, you know, perspective of, um, from clear back from the vendor and all the way through to contract compliance. I, I, this is summed up really, really well, and it's worked for us very, very well. And this allows for the accounts payable department to work with the other departments because the data needs to be shared across the entire supply chain. And what we found in AP recovery auditing is those organizations that don't work well with the different departments or they have even isolated locations where AP is in a different building than purchasing. We find more recoveries in those organizations than the organizations that share reporting and work together at understanding where the money is going, who they're buying from, and understanding what their exposure is and how a vendor can present exposure. And so taking a step further past this slide is identifying recovery auditing is about money coming back to your bottom line. It's very tangible money. 
but there's more money out there than just the AP recovery auditing. So when we're talking about AP recovery auditing, an example is you know, to say, how much can I expect to receive in AP recovery auditing? We're looking at 36 months worth of data. And let's assume in that 36 months of data, we're looking at about $2.2 billion in spend. There's an idea of what you can expect to see in recoveries. Typically, in a recovery audit, it's 0.02% to 0.05%. And so what that would mean to you is about $440,000 on the low end and just over a million on the high end. And that's very tangible money. And when we talk about this holistic approach to the supply chain, there's more money than just what's coming back in through the recovery audit. It's that stopping the money from going out in the front end. And so money from recovery auditing can be significant. Analytics and supply chain advancement leading to this holistic approach can give you more money that is saving the organization as a whole. And so the, this example is based on, let's say you had $300 million in annual spend, and you have about 4,000 to 5,000 vendors. You may be saying, well, no, 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 I have eight or 10,000 vendors. Part of this process is identifying the duplicate vendors and the inactive vendors, which also pose risk to the organization and moving the vendors to a more cost-effective payment method. There's a lot of money to be saved from going from paper checks over to ACH or even revenue to be generated through different card programs that you could be paying. And as I previously mentioned, you may be involving six, seven different vendors with all these different data sets. And it's this holistic approach that is going to bring money back to the bottom line and also save money from going out the door. And so, Eric, have you seen changes in your organization as far as maybe not money coming directly in, but cost savings? Yeah, certainly. You know, um, I, again, I think we're, we're kind of highlighting some of the, the main points of our, of our previous conversation in saying um, certainly cost savings on, um, you know, being able to review controls, being, being able to understand better our business, um, and, and, you know, like you said, this is all sort of upside to us. Any recovery is sort of icing on the cake. But certainly um, from the perspective of, you know, overall risk management, you know, this, this has been a, a for, for sure a cost savings for us in, you know, having a, a more holistic look at, at what we're doing, making sure we're doing it the right way, um, and making those tweaks along the way when we discover things that we're not doing so well uh, and having that partner and sort of behind us and, and helping us to identify those opportunities. Okay. And so what we've covered today really is identifying some of the common misconceptions and reviewing some examples of where recoveries can happen. We've discussed what to expect in a recovery audit, and it's those expectations that really set the audit up for success. And as long as the team at your organization knows the audit's happening, what their involvement's going to be, there's no surprises, the audit then just has a positive outcome because everybody expected what was happening and certainly money to the bottom line is always a positive outcome. Um, and then looking at the supply chain of the whole organization and being able to document with reports and outcomes and show what the outcome of the audit is, is really valuable. It's, it, I won't say it's as valuable as the money to the bottom line, but those reports carry on the value of the recovery audit throughout the year as you use them in the meetings. And so we've really covered and hopefully answered any misconceptions and questions and identified what to expect in a recovery audit. Um, we'd like to open it up at this point to questions and answers, and I think Emily would be receiving some of those questions. And if you have some and haven't already you know, turned your questions in, certainly use the chat box and type the questions. And Eric and I will do our best to answer your questions. Thanks, Lisa. We do have some questions coming in. The first question is, how much of my staff time is required during an audit? OK, good question. So as we mentioned, the IT department is where you're going to feel the immediate time constraint, and, it, and really it takes about a day, not the full day for your IT, but about a day of dedicated understanding what data tables are needed and information. And most organizations then run the data dump overnight. 
So it really, it, within that 24-hour process, everything from the IT side is done. There might be one or two more phone calls with the IT because um, once we get the data, we, we line it up and ask questions if we have any. And then the next time for your staff, specific to the accounts payable, is we always want that one contact point that we're going to have a weekly meeting. And that weekly meeting can range from five minutes to half an hour where we're running through a discussion on these are the vendors we want to reach out to, these are the vendors that we have reached out to, and really more just a level set and let you know what's going on with the audit. So that half an hour a week, which you know, if you have an appointment that comes up, it can be moved to the following week. And then at the onset of the recovery audit, there's about a one hour meeting with the auditor so we can discuss what's going to happen in the audit and set the expectation. And at the end of the audit, there's about another two hour meeting where there may be more than just the accounts payable. You might want to have some of your directors in on the meeting to really discuss the outcome of the audit and what was found. So other than a few meetings, that's pretty much what your time commitment is. Great. Thanks, Lisa. Our next question is, what if you find a recovery, but our team has already been working on it? So one of the things in recovery auditing that an audit firm like Global Edge will do is we ask the client to please do a self-audit first. And what that self-audit is doing is identifying anything that you already know you're working on. If you have found a duplicate through your own process, or maybe you have a contract compliance issue that you've already identified. And so by doing that self-audit and presenting it to the audit firm, it, it creates a relationship there where we are not looking at the same thing you've already looked at and also goes back to that vendor relationship. You don't want to have your team reaching out to the vendor and us reaching out to the vendor as well. And so by knowing ahead of time these are the recoveries you're already working on, we will just exclude those from the audit, one, not work on them, and two, not reach out to the vendor. And so that list gets presented before the audit ever starts. And I'll, I'll want to jump in here also um, because I, I have a slightly different perspective and, and, and a comment. You know, the, this, this type of, of a recovery and this type of a service, if you will, is a little bit on the honor system. And I, what I, one of the things I've really appreciated working with Global Edge in, in the past is, um, you know, so, so Lisa described the process of you know, kind of presenting up front what it is that Mayo is working on. But we have been, have had instances before where during the audit, we just so happened to be in parallel working the same vendor in the same situation. And um, what I have really appreciated about working with Global Edge is that never once have I, you know, have I come to them, um, you know, sort of after discovering we're both walking down the same path with the same vendor and have them say to me, well, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. This wasn't in the the pre-audit discussion that we had. It wasn't, you know, it's within our scope, and so you know we're going to claim it as a recovery. They've been very respectful of, um, of both our relationships with our vendors as well as with us, and you know has respectfully kind of stepped away from those situations where we were already pursuing something. Uh, and, and I think that's something that's a bit unique in working with them. Um, you know, not, I'm not sure all firms would be quite that you know, that generous with us, but um, that's one of the things I found that's been very, very nice. And Eric, that's why we did it. You know, I mean, it's it's being up front with the client and, and understanding that you we acknowledge you may be working on something. And yes, it might not be on that report, but it's setting the expectation that if you're already working on something, we're not going to do it too. Absolutely. Thanks, Lisa and Eric. Our next question is, what if we have more than one ERP system? Okay, we, we have that quite often. In fact, that's a really good time to do a recovery audit. If, if you're looking to um, switch ERP systems or you're upgrading your system, you would want to do a recovery audit before and then a few, maybe six, seven months after that upgrade because it can help you identify where data didn't transfer clearly. But if you have more than one ERP system, it might involve your IT or different ITs because you might have different sites and those ERP systems might be assigned to different sites. And we would get the data and it would still transfer the same way. It would just be three data tables instead of one. 
And once we get the data, the burden is on the recovery audit firm to then migrate the data together. And that can be a really great benefit to an organization because you may not have been able to identify duplicate payments or contract compliance issues, or maybe you're qualifying for tiered pricing and you're not able to identify it through your own reports because it's on three different systems. Once Global Edge gets all the data and we migrate it together, we're able to give you back those 36-month look reports that show you what you're spending across the organization where previously you might not have been able to compile the data with all three different data sets. So you're going to get great reporting, and from the audit perspective, it's just one more step for us to do, but we migrate the data together. Yeah, and I would add also, you know, if you have multiple ERP systems, what that immediately flags in my mind is much greater opportunity for recoveries, because most times those systems aren't talking to one another, they're very disparate, and they're, they're doing different functions, and so I'm, I'm guessing, I'm speculating, without knowing the business or the ERP systems, that your opportunities are going to be probably bigger even than what ours would be at Mayo because we, you know, we really just have the one system. So something to think about. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks, guys. We have a we have a bunch of questions rolling through now. Um, the next one is, how do you work with GPOs on contract pricing audits? So when, when we look at a recovery audit and we get involved in the contract pricing, their contracts can be stored in different places and contracts can be negotiated with the hospital or maybe they're negotiated at the group pur purchasing organization level. And so having access to those contracts is really important for the recovery auditor to be able to sign in, hopefully remotely, and see those contracts. And what that allows us to do is also monitor is the, which contract has the better rate and which rate is the vendor looking at or billing to um, and making sure that the vendor is staying within the contracted rate. And so having GPO contracts, the important thing for the audit is being able to have the auditor have that sign-in access. And, and there are some GPOs where we've actually had clients that say, wait a minute, you can see those contracts? And we say, yeah, for other clients we see those contracts all the time. And they don't even they have access, they just didn't know how to get to it or where to go find it. But because our auditors are working within these GPO contracts all the time, they know where to go look and how, who to ask if they need to find a contract. And again, it's something they do every day and they're experienced at it. Terrific. Thanks, Lisa. The, the next question is once you receive the audit, the data, how long until I receive recoveries? So the recoveries can start coming back. Usually within the first month, you might start seeing some of those, as we've talked about, low-hanging fruit. You see a duplicate payment. There's two checks out there. Um, it, they both they didn't know where to apply the cash. That money is going to come in pretty quickly. Um, but as soon as the vendor is we identify a recovery, the auditor reaches out to the vendor, communicates it to the vendor, and at that point, if the vendor sees it, it's going to be cut right back to you. Um, so depending on the vendor's payable process, it, it can be within the first 30 days. But then it's going to continue over the life of the recovery audit. And a typical recovery audit might be two to three months, um, and you'll still see some recoveries maybe come in in month four, five, or six but the audit itself would be done. And so in the first month, you usually see about 5 to 10% of your overall recoveries. It's in that month two and three that you're going to see probably 30 to 40% of your recoveries coming in at that point. Thanks again, Lisa, for answering that question. Um, we will take one more question. We do have a lot of questions coming in, um, and we have several that regarding computer systems and pricing um, and, and different um, platforms around that whole computer system. For those of you that are asking those questions, we will follow up with you um, regarding those and specifically answer your questions. In the meantime, we'll take one additional question, and that's on imaging. And the question is, what if we only became imaged two years ago? Okay, 
So with the, with the computer systems and being able to see the data, as we mentioned in the past, the auditors sat in a conference room with banker boxes and rubber fingers. And the more um, that a computer system is imaged, so we have invoices, are they imaged? Contracts, are they imaged? The answer to those might be yes. The next question the audit firm is going to ask you is, will we have remote access to those images? And so in this question, you're saying only two years is imaged. Well, so if we find a recovery that extends back three years, we're going to you know, look at the banker box and actually pull the document itself. But with the two years that are imaged, we can usually identify the pattern there, or most of the recoveries are going to happen within that recent two years. So it's no problem if we're you know, looking at half of the data imaged and half of it not. It just means the auditor might be on site a little bit longer to look through paper boxes versus image documents. And again, I mentioned that asking permission of your IT for the auditor to have remote access. That sets the, the temperament for the audit. If the auditor has access to remote access into your ERP system, the, the invoices, the contracts, there's less involvement of the auditor and you really don't see them in your organization and it doesn't involve getting a room for the auditor. They can work remotely and so the only thing you see is the money coming back in the door. But having it split between two years or three years of image documents, it, it just means that the auditor has to be on site maybe a day longer. Great. Thanks for that insight, Lisa. And that wraps up the Accounts Payable Recovery Audit webinar for today. This afternoon, um, you will be receiving a follow-up email where you can request more information, including the today's presentation deck, as well as a brief feedback survey. If you have any questions in the meantime, you can reach us at www.globaledge.us. Thanks, Lisa and, and Eric, for participating. I wanted to just throw in there, too, we will be doing a webinar on sanction checks coming up. Terrific, yes, in April, the sanction check webinar. Thanks for bringing that up, Lisa. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and have a great afternoon.